Welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast with me, Joseph Sakara and Damon Smith. It's good to be back. This is where we talk about shamanism from the ground up. And in this episode, we're going to be looking back at um, chillicity, um, specifically what Damon has called physical chillicity and how we can apply that specifically to what we've been looking at recently, which is stage three of learning shamanism. Um, but first of all, I think we have a few things to cover. So Damon, um, I understand you've actually been away out of the country and done a shamanic retreat. Is that is that right? Um, well, we we did sort of a mixture uh, retreat. I don't know if you call it a retreat. We did a a long week a long weekend, and um, we did a long weekend. It was definitely shamanism related. We definitely did some spirit dance. We did a, basically did a weekend on the air trigrams. Yeah. Uh, and we did a bunch of different things. We did some spirit dance. We did some what people would call martial arts. We did, uh, you know, various stuff to try and uh, give people an idea of how the trigrams work, the energy changes work. And yeah, it was it was in Austria, in Graz. It was definitely Wolf and NG sort of branded. Uh, we're going to do another one in um, in Austria uh, a little bit later in the year, not a lot later in the year. Um, and so. That one will be proper, hundred uh, uh, percent spirit dance. So this one retreat. was more like testing the waters. Uh, it was, it was, a, it was a bunch of different things for people to have a go at. It was very, very tortial teen. That's probably the best way to put it. Mm. Uh, we did all kinds of stuff, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And and we had some great feedback from people, some of the people who who were on the course as well. And I think I wasn't the only one who enjoyed it. But I had a thoroughly great time. Partly because Austria is just an amazing country. Um, and uh, uh, Tamo um, uh, was a guy who organised it, uh, one of our now fairly long-standing patrons. And, um, you know, we we went up in the woods um, and uh, did lots of other things outside of the seminar. And, uh, yeah, just a fantastic time all around. And um, like I say, we're going to do another one, I think, in April. Uh, there'll be details about it on, on the Patreon page. Yeah, uh, speaking and, and of on which, this podcast, and on this podcast, we'll uh, we'll keep people up to date on this. Yeah, uh, absolutely, this podcast absolutely. Well. Um, but speaking of which, uh, we I can't remember. It's quite a while since we had an episode out, but I can't remember exactly how far we have to go back and start thanking people for being uh, members of our wonderful tribe patrons. Uh, we have thanked uh, quite a few of you on the Heretics podcast, but we try to thank everybody on both podcasts. So if it's all right with Joe, I'll do a quick width through of our of our patrons. Um, I'm going to start from uh, September, although I think we released one in in October last year, Woven Energy episode. I'm going to start from September and work forwards. And if if I miss you out, uh, you know it's not deliberate. We did read everybody out on a recent uh, Heretics episode, so so hopefully um, that'll be okay. So going back to the start of September, we got. Sandra Rebecca, Rachel uh, Jones Derris, Chris Kelly, David Horswell, David Nietfield, Daniel Ristow, Michal Virant, who was um, one of the guys on the on the seminar. Uh, cool guy, um, very nice guy um, that I hadn't met before. Uh, so thanks, Miha. Uh, Miha actually made a big difference on the seminar as well. Um, John Kavanagh, um, Ilko. Uh, long-standing patron uh, put his put his amount up. Thanks, Ilko. You're a starter. Uh, Ethan Murchie, uh, David, uh, Jonathan Young, uh, Melanie Popiolek. Uh, thanks ever so much, Melanie. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, wow. And the, our latest one, uh, Pamela Agin or Agin. Um, thanks, Pamela. So um, <laughs> I think so I think you, part of this. I'm, I mean, but part of me is thinking. Wow, I hope uh, I hope more people don't sign up because we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of well, this no, is just you in, in in utter shock that people are actually uh, supporting us. Yeah, on yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, it is fantastic. Uh, we've said it many times before. Uh, it makes a lot of difference. Uh, it's made a huge difference to me in terms of like just being able to keep doing this thing. Um, I mean, both the podcasts. Um, the uh, my work has been has been all consuming really uh in recent times and um i i want to get more stuff out this year uh, than we got out last year yeah uh that's definitely my my intention 
and I am on my my not so new work. I've been working in Cambridge now for I think it's five months now, so it's just <laughs> I'm not that new anymore. Uh, I'm, I feel like I'm getting on top of it a little bit. Um, so so hopefully we'll be able to do that, get some more stuff out this year. I did put up some pictures, uh, just bridging into the subject of today's podcast. I did put some pictures up on Patreon uh, as a sort of teaser for this episode. Um, and they are pictures of a Japanese group um, who, um, who do a form of spirit dance. Um, we, we're going to... The reason I did that is that um, I didn't really want to give the impression that uh, we're talking exclusively about Mongolian spirit dance on this episode. I'm going to be, or we're going to be introducing a bunch of new terminology and it's all going to be in Mongol. Uh, So just to explain why that is, there are some concepts that I want to talk about and and reuse ideas or or, ideas. Uh, I want to introduce some words of things that I want to then continue to talk about as we record more podcasts in the future, as we get kind of delve more deeply into spirit dance. Yeah. And and the words I'm going to introduce are in Mongol, uh, but I didn't want to give the impression that we're only talking about Mongol and spirit dance. So I, what I did was I put some pictures of a uh, an awesome, fairly awesome form of Japanese spirit dance, very old photos, um, you know, dating back to... Uh, you know, maybe you know, nineteen fifties. Mm. Um, the, the photos are not really dated, but they're all black and white. And uh, based on the people in them, uh, you're looking at that kind of time period nineteen forties, late nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, into the nineteen sixties. Um, uh, this is a spirit dance that was taught by a lady called Kitamura Sayo. As long long standing uh, listeners to the podcast probably aware. Uh, a lot of shamans are female. Uh, a surprisingly large proportion of shamans are female, uh, even in uh, fairly male-dominated societies, which is quite interesting. Uh, this has yeah. certainly been true in in Japan for a very long time. And Kitamura Sayo uh, was a, a quite a prominent shamaness who, like me, specialised in spirit dance. And... Um, which she called uh, Muga no Mai, uh, which is um, basically the, the dance of emptiness, which I think is a really cool, really cool way of describing spirit dance. Uh, and that idea of emptiness comes from um, this this idea. If you recall, we had a conversation sometime about what's the difference between spirit dance and an ordinary dance. Do you remember that? I do. Uh, yeah, and, and one of the things we said, one of the differences uh, between spirit dance and ordinary, I think I give ballroom dancing as the opposite, as the exact opposite of what spirit dance is. Um, the uh, is where it comes from. It comes from that settel. When you're doing spirit dance, you're not deciding what you're doing. Um, the underlying spirit is deciding that. And so one of the ways is, I think we said, you can detect fake spirit dance, especially if there's multiple shamans involved, multiple people doing the dances. They're all doing the same thing. Uh, you're, yeah. pretty sure, you're pretty sure that that's, uh, you know, um, not. So It's become ritualised. Um, before we move on, let me just wind yeah, sure, us back sure. up a very, very tiny bit. Um, back to Patreon very, very briefly. Um, what can people expect? if they do support us on Patreon very quickly and then we'll get on with the podcast. So it's uh, if you do want to um, support us on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash woven dash energy, is it? Or is it just woven energy? It's just woven energy. There's no dash. Excellent. So patreon.com slash woven energy. And what can people All expect word, yeah. if, they, uh, if they support us over there? Sure. So, well, they can expect to, for sure, they can expect to get thanked. <laughs> that's what we... They can be put on the spot the, and publicised. That <laughs> seems to be the what we what we do. Um, the, you know, a, a lot of the aspirations we have for things that the patrons can expect are, are... Some of them are still somewhat down the road, particularly the Grove, which is our big, um, our big development that's ongoing. Uh, that hasn't been going. That's one of my New Year's resolutions: is to get the groove cracking again. I mean, there is something there. It's groove.wovenengine.com. 
Um, but I this will have I videos and all sorts of extra resources, won't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, we, we have audio podcasts. Obviously, videos are pretty useful. Um, I may do the, of the War of Energy seminars uh, that we run, uh, starting with the one in April. I um, I think it's April. Uh, could be May. Um, we I, I may video some of that um, and um, and stick that up. Um, so, so down the line, uh, there will be some advantages from the Grove coming down the line to people. But just in terms of what's there now, there are different uh, levels. Everybody gets thanked. Uh, you can you can be a patron for one one dollar a month, uh, and you know it's some people um, uh, you know support us at that level. Uh, it, that's fantastic. You know, one dollar a month. It's amazing to me. It's more like. Uh, people showing us support, you know, and um, but in terms of, of being able to justify continuing to do this stuff when there are other pressures, uh, certainly on our respective families and this type of stuff, it, it, it's certainly been helpful to show that we have this this support behind us. Um, There's people out there listening and taking. Yeah, action. exactly, exactly. For on Patreon itself, and it should all be on the Grove as well, but it's it's not all in the Grove yet. Um, there's a bunch of additional content, um, like the thing I referred to. I, I, uh, for some of the earlier episodes, I, before I started this new job, I got some fairly, uh, I think good episode notes for different episodes that came out. I do intend to pick that up again. Um, but there are also just like, you know, whenever we bring a new episode out, I, I tend to stick up a, a post on Patreon about it. And then, then people are able to comment on that. And the vast majority of that stuff is available to people from the sort of five dollar a month level. Um, in, in terms of just accessing the content, there's some of it that's only available for seven dollar a month. A little bit that's only available for seven dollar a month uh, people. Um, and then we have our kind of power patrons at fifteen dollars a month who. Um, we we had a private discussion group on the old platform for the group that's been revamped, but we um, we're getting the new uh, discussion group on the Grove, so those guys get access to that private discussion. Um, yeah, yeah, and then um, and then we have uh, we have um, a number of founder patrons. Uh, for a long time, we only had one, uh, who's wonderful. He's he's a founder patron who doesn't want us to uh, tell us their name. Um, but we we now have more than one founder patron. They're forty dollars a month. That's amazing. Uh, and basically, that that patron level was intended um, to for people who really wanted to get involved and help out and and, and work with us to get some of these episodes out. Um, uh, it's just fantastic that people are sort of willing to support us at that kind of at that kind of level. Uh, unbelievable, really. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's all, as far as I'm concerned, the whole lot's wonderful. <laughs> it's just, uh, like I said, I've said many times that I'd, I'd be happy with that number of listeners at one point in time, uh, let alone patrons, you know. And so, so another thing is we did hit our, um, our 25 patron target. So we have promised to put out a patrons only episode. Um, when we do put out a patrons only episode, that is available at all levels, um, I make that available at all levels, including the one dollar a month level. Um, it's just so the additional content stuff is is um, for kind of the the high levels and that. Yeah, and and we just to note that behind the scenes, uh, we have uh, patrons who have got quite heavily involved in in what we're doing. Um, and um, you know, it's a the, way of bringing the community a bit closer together, getting a bit more contact going rather than us sat yeah. here. Just it's, yeah, it's wonderful, to be honest. <laughs> if, Excellent. It, and, and there will be more of that in future. I mean, the real constraint on that is my time and your time. Mm. Um, it, that, that's been the big constraint on it. And like I say, I've made a New Year's resolution to spend more time on that this year. Yes, and I will do the same. Um, okay, excellent. So let's get cracking with the episode. So we were on with um, Chelsea. You were talking about Chelsea and the physical side of Chelsea and where the spirit dance comes from. Um, the Satel, I believe you you left it on. And I do think yeah. 
if people want a quick catch up episode, it would be um, episode seven, eight, and nine as the very first part of Call, and the the ones we did yeah. on on the on the basics of what Chilicity actually is from a from a shamanic. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, we went in a good fairly old amount of detail on it, um, but what what we didn't really do was break it down in terms of. Uh, as, what, one of the things we said was, as you move, we, we've talked about these seven stages, and we've we sort of got through into stage three now, um, which we've referred to as a spirit dance. Uh, yeah. But the like, spirit dance is like an example of stage three, uh, example of what happens at stage three. And the stage three is very much like a legwork, putting in the legwork, putting in the graft, putting in the, the hours kind of stage, um, and on your on your technique basically. And we've sort of explained Chalisti in terms of its components, what actually it's made up of. And what we've said is every time you you get into a new level of shamanism, of shamanic practice, a new level of technique, that's a bit beyond our last one, you pick up a bunch of new stuff, but then you return to Chalisti. Yeah. Um, but Chalisti can also be understood, or incidentally, also if you want to cut, if you if you want to catch up or um, get up to speed on... I'm just getting the list of episodes up. Um, on the the level we're at, um, I did do a thing called a... Um, what did I call it? A monologue, uh, which oh, was a yeah, b- bit did, of yeah. a review. Yeah, which was a bit of a review um, on Hook Arug, which is the, basically the... The bag of basics uh, for spirit jacks, or a bag of basics for spirit dance. So I did a, a monologue on that. But what I mean by physical chelicity, well, we said there's three components of chelicity, but there's also a sort of three levels of understanding of chelicity, and these two things are not the they're not really the same thing. Um, these are just like when you're when you're practicing your shamanic technique, that light weight observation of self that we talked about in all the Amskar episodes, that that, tech, that ability to observe yourself mm. internally um, and in your context to a certain extent without affecting yourself. So remember we said things to, to observe your breathing without affecting your breathing, to be able to observe your heart rate without affecting your heart rate, and that would extend to, in, in terms of spirit dance, that would extend to ex- observing your skull, skeleton, your skeletal alignment, the ligaments, the bones, the muscles, the circulatory system, nervous system, all that kind of stuff, to being able to observe all of that in a very lightweight way, so to the extent that you don't affect anything natural that is going on there. And this is the skill of Amska. It, it's a skill that's very, very important when you come into spirit dance because if you haven't got that skill, it's not going to be spirit dance. It's going to be ordinary dance. Um, does that make some kind of sense? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So when I say that Chalisti can also be broken down into three other things that aren't sort of Bat, Toshaltin and Gukuk, um, these three other things are more like modes of that op- observation. Things that have the the attention of bat, things that get hold of the attention of bat, or that, but, you know, the Burchi Katarate, that unfocused, sharp attention. Mm. Where does it lie when you're practicing your shamanic technique? There's sort of three levels of where that can be. And they have names as well. I do apologize for all the Mongol <laughs> words. But we've got Tonglug, we've got Ayug, and we've got one of the worst, most difficult names to pronounce, <laughs> words to pronounce in Mongol, uh, Yaslachwi. Excuse <laughs> you, Dennis. I, I, I do apologise, but it's that kind of language. But the, the, we're just, the pictures of the Japanese, um, the Japanese spirit dance that are up there um, from, um, from Kitamura, they are... Uh, and and her, her group of people, they are uh, there to remind... I, we could use any of these Mongol words, any of them, to talk about the stuff those guys do. Yeah, and they would still apply, and they would be, mm-hmm. you know, perfectly relevant, even though the Mongol words are not Japanese words. Uh, the, the reason we don't use English words is they tend not to be any for the things we're trying to talk about. That's the, that's the big issue. And so that that... Up to this point, through the episodes on Chalisti and the episodes on Amska, we've mostly been talking. We've mostly been talking about 
um, that kind of tongue look. That that that's that whole thing about not thinking, um, tongue being look. empty. Yeah, not thinking. You know, it's it's all my transliteration. It, it, it's written in this beautiful. Um, if you were to write down in Mongol, it's this beautiful cursive script. But in in my demons, you know, write it like you say it. Uh, Mongolian romanization would be something like T O N G L U G Tonglug. Okay. Um, and um, that's what we've talked about to date, mostly when we've been talking about Chalisti. Now we're going to move on to the next level, and that's what this episode's setting the scene for, is the next level, which is Ayug. Um, this is more like when you, when you are uh, doing your spurt dance, you are effectively, you, you're vessel-like, not just in a spiritual form, not just in that, you know, empty your mind, uh, kind of, you know, basic chalisti training kind of form, you also need to be uh, physically empty. And what I mean by that is you need your, your movements need to maintain a kind of chalisti, uh, a kind of ayug. You, it, what it is is your, your alignment of your body while you're moving through your you know, what is effectively, it's not random, but it, it, it appears to be random. You're a random spirit dance arriving at, arising out of the satel. Um, it has, your, your, both your, your mind is empty, but your body also has a vessel-like quality. And so this is the, the next thing. Um, the next thing that uh, is a differentiator between uh, normal dance and spirit dance, you can see uh, some people who are phenomenally good normal normal dancers. I have a, a few good friends because I, I, you know, hung around with some people in the dance community, um, the normal dance community. Uh, they're phenomenal. One of their great skills a lot of them have is called isolation. They isolate parts mm-hmm. of their body. And they, they're able to move parts of their body in isolation and they use it in these different ways. And it looks super cool. If they're good at it, it looks super cool. But it ain't spirit dance because in doing that, that they're doing the exact opposite of what you want to do in spirit dance, which is embody a unity and, and keep that vessel-like quality on. And so what I'm saying is really you can you can see you can see some dancers and you say that person's an amazing dancer, but they're not doing spirit dance at all. They're, they're, they're dance from a spirit dance point of view. If you're looking at it through the eyes of a shaman, you would say, that's bad if they were claiming it was spirit dance. And you do see this. You see people doing ordinary dance and putting on some sort of shaman robes. And, mm. <laughs> and uh, they're good dancers, but they're bad shamans. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's the thing. And you can, tell, you can tell it immediately from the lack of physical chalisti in the movements that they're making. The movements may be elegant. The movements may be, the movements may be very elegant. They may look amazing. They may be very uh, gymnastic or athletic or, or elegant or graceful, but there's no chalisti. If you look at a different, if you look at a system like a dance, or you look at a system, say like a martial art, there's certain yeah. body mechanics which you stick to within that specific system. Um, yeah, that's, that's not what I'm talking that's, about. Though that's the opposite of what you're talking about. But is yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're talking about moving chilis- moving fr- from a chalistic point of view, is everything moving together? In which case, it, it has its own yes. system in itself, or it's 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 holistic. So spirit dance is holistic. The whole body, the the, the mind and the spirit and the body, as you might imagine, are completely unified. Uh, incidentally, the, the 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 third level out of this three stage Tongluk Ayug and Yathlakhui. Um, God, my monumental pronunciation is not what it used to be. Um, the, that's the spirit level, yeah? So you have chalisti and spirit as well. But we're here we're talking about the chalisti of the body. And so when you're performing your spirit dance, when you're doing your spirit dance, there is a chalisti in the physicality of the dance. And it, it's... it's um, And you can see it. And, and one of the ways... That, you you work on it when you're doing spirit dance, and the, the key point is it doesn't matter what kind of spirit dance you're doing, 
you can start working on your ayuk. You can t- start working on your physical chalisti. Because there are, like all things in shamanism, there are a whole host of different techniques you can do to start developing your ayuk. And also, like in shamanism, the techniques are examples. There's lots of different ones. But you've got to be careful, because when I say there's a bunch of techniques for working on ayuk, what I mean is those techniques are not dance movements, yeah? Mm -hmm. They are techniques that you can work on in any dance movement, yeah? Mm. So this is the point. This is a a, a way of... um, uh, a way of making your... I'm sat here doing all these movements now. Nobody can see anything. We need the group. <laughs> we need the group. But you can... you can Basically, you can work on any of these techniques in any dance movement. So, for instance... But the, the Japanese technique, spread, the purpose of those techniques is to teach you the body mechanics of this to physical pr- pr- chalicity. No, in it's the not body th- mechanics. No, no, it's not body mechanics. It's not body mechanics. It's physical chalicity. But we've got to it's, learn how to connect all everything together exactly and but, but it's the not point is mechanics. you can learn how to connect anything together with any body mechanics okay that's the point yeah and so what you do is you take like um it's like looking at the world through a filter or looking at your that lightweight observation of self the you know the eyes of the eagle the bird mm-hmm. arate that you practice in your basic chalicity training, that you practice in your AMSCAR training to be able to observe yourself holistically without affecting what you're doing. In When you move into level three, you want to start to be able to observe yourself with a different unfocused focus, a different uh, expansive focus. And those those different expansive focus is, is it focuses or fork, foci? I don't know. Uh, those different, <laughs> those different expansive Failed focuses. English, right? <laughs> um, uh, those different, those different flavors of word she called harate. Yeah. I want to give some Mongol names to them and, and start explaining what they mean. Uh, so that these are just examples. There's endless techniques like this uh, that you can do. But my, my point is, you don't do them all at once. What you do is when you're practicing your spirit dance using the tech kind of techniques we've talked about already and more techniques we'll talk about in the future, no matter what the physical techniques are that you're doing with your spirit dance, whether you're doing the same spirit dance that, that these guys um, uh, from the, the Kitamura people, the Kitamura lineage uh, have done and do, uh, if you're doing that, which is, is beautiful spirit dance, um, you, I could do any one of these techniques on that particular flavor spirit dance. I could do any one of these techniques on Mongolian spirit dance. I could do any one of these techniques on another type of spirit dance, something like uh, Teodori or something like that from Japan, Kagura. I could do them from, you know, um, South American spirit dance. It doesn't matter. I can take one of these techniques and I can apply it to any of those weird, wonderful flavors of spirit dance. Uh, from anywhere all over the world. The Ainu people spoke crane dance. Yeah, you could apply it to that as well. Yeah, and and these techniques basically allow you to start to develop physical chalicity, not just um, not just uh, kind of mind based chalicity. You know, clearing the baseline. So, yeah. would would body unification from a physical point of view be the wrong way to think about it? Uh, no, um, in in spirit dance, the body must be unified. Uh, so the, the way to think about it is if you practice these techniques, your body will become unified. That's probably the best way to put it. That will happen. Mm-hmm. Um, what you shouldn't try to do is practice all these techniques simultaneously. It's when you're doing your spirit dance, you would choose one of these techniques to unfocus on rather than focus on. One of these techniques to batshure, <laughs> batshure on, yeah, um, the the. The um, uh, you you pick one of these to focus on, and then on a different occasion when you're doing your spirit dance, you might focus on another one, and on a different occasion you might focus on another one. You don't try to do them all together. What what happens when you do that is you pick up. This is guchuk, you know, bat toshultin and guchuk. You pick up the guchuk of that particular technique uh, when you practice that technique, and then when you do the same spirit dance, but with a different focus, with a different technique, then you you pick up a different kind of guchuk from that. And all of those guchuks add up to something that approximates or that, that approaches physical chalicity. That's the idea. Um, 
Right. So probably best to start giving some examples. Exactly. Can, I think I'll get a clearer idea once once I hear. Yeah, yeah. Example so we have technique. already we have already talked about one of these, which is Ashqui. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is this idea of. Um, and incidentally, if you're Patreon, there's a. I think there's a video in there somewhere of me uh, showing a bit of Ashqui, kind of informal video. Um, Ashqui is this kind of heaviness of the, the, the idea of the, the shaman's flesh hanging on their bones, almost like the shaman becomes a skeleton um, and the flesh just hangs there. In the same way that, you know, if you see, if you see Mongolian shamans in all their regalia, uh, they have all kinds of stuff hung off their body, basically. Mm. And people talk about it, the shaman's garments or the shaman's robes or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but actually, it's just a whole bunch of stuff that hung off themselves. Well, one of the things that hang off themselves is their muscles and sinews and tendons and and, and it develop a sense of heaviness. And we will go into each one of these in detail in future episodes. I just wanted to set the scene in this episode. So Ashgui is one, uh, one of these uh, Ayug uh, techniques. Mm. Um, so another one would be Numlach. So one day you might be doing your spirit dance, uh, doing the stuff that we, you know, things like tilling and other things that we've done. And on that day, you'll you'll work on Ashgui. Uh, just remember that when I say work on, I don't mean mess up your basic cellisti. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're talking about the Burjhi uh, Kertharte. We're talking about the lightweight observation of self through bat um that you develop through your Amska practice. So if you're finding this kind of thing difficult, if you can't attempt these techniques uh, like Ashgui uh, without thinking about stuff a lot or, you know, doing too much thinking, um, th- then then don't do them. Just go back and practice the Amsko exercises or go back and practice the Chilisti exercises more. It's like, it's like that, yeah. So another one would be Numlach. Um, numlach. Yeah, Numlach is, this is like a, a bow, uh, like an archery kind of bow. Um, the the Mongolian bow is very very actually a very very sophisticated for when it was used, when when it was used by uh, Genghis Khan and his armies. The Mongolian bow was um, was a, a super high tech bit of equipment. It's made of it's laminated. It's made of layers of sinew and, and wood and bone, various things. But it's basically a laminated bow. And it's when it's when it's not strong, it's curved over in a C shape. And then when you string it, you open up that C-shape and you bend it back on itself and string it like that. And it produces a a potentially very, very high draw strength on the bow. But the question is, what does the bow brace itself against? What's it called? What's the bow called? The the bow is actually in the word numluck. So that num bit at the start, that's the bow. Cool. Um, And the the key point is that it refers in particular... Uh, the lack ending is kind of just turning the word bow into a verb, which yeah. is to talk about this thing that Mongol does that um, that is uh, quite unusual as a language in terms of our kind of language. Uh, it's it's this, a sense of being like a bow. It's a, a storing energy in your body like a bow. And the key point in terms of that holisticness, that, that unity aspect that you were talking about, what does the bow brace itself against? Self against. This is the key point with Numluck. What is your holistic structure at every given point in your feet? So if you're doing spirit dance for 15 minutes, every single second during that 15-minute period, Numluck is on. Your body is braced against itself in every way. Every part of your body is braced against every other part of the body. It's storing energy continuously in the same, exact same way that a bow stores energy. So, does that make sense? It mate? does. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm just trying it now. It's a. It's a bit yeah. like. It's a bit like uh, when you compress inwards, but the whole body compresses inwards. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the a bow stores energy under compression. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 not simply compressing everything in uh, into the center of the body. It's it's more like the character of the torso, the limbs, the head, the neck, the feet, uh, the hands, the fingers, the toes. The character of all of those things throughout the entirety of a spurt dance 
although they're all continuously moving and they're moving in ways that are unified together, they are all constantly storing energy within their own structure. That's the point. Brilliant. And this is the energy that the, the vessel that you're creating, the vessel-like structure that you're creating with your ayuk, with your physical chalisti, this is the energy, some of the energy that's being stored and contained within that. But of course, that energy is not just sitting there. It's not like a battery. It's not just sitting there. It's in constant movement, constant flux, constant change. But despite the constant movement, the constant flux and the constant change, it is continually contained in the way that a bow contains energy. And when the Mongol bow is strung, it's under tension at all times. And this is the point with numluck. I don't mean like a physical tension. The part of the bow that stores energy through compression is under compression at all times. Yeah. And the part of the bow that, 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 you know, it's like the front and the back of the bow, isn't it? The back's under compression, the front's under, it's kind of stretched. Yeah. Uh, both parts are storing energy at all times. And so this is the idea of numluck. Um, and so that, that's kind of the first two. Ashgri, which is a kind of, Hang you in, on the a, bones. In, in, in a practical way, yeah. if you were practicing a, a basic movement from the spirit dance, um, yes, how would you how would you apply numluck numluck to us? To well, a you very don't simple... apply it. You don't apply it. What you do is observe yourself with your lightweight observation of self that you've delivered that you've developed through your Amska practice, mm -hmm. and you see if it's there. And if it's not there, then you need to. You need to get it there somehow. Um, and um, one of the things that you would would observe is that you, you, you observe a springiness in your body. There's a springiness. If you move one way, there's a springiness that tends to want to go the other way. Mm. Any part of you, your foot, your hand, your neck, your head, anything, there's a kind of springiness inside your body. Um, and and this is what numb looks about. It's... It's something that you, if you practice it, you'll find it's easier to understand what I'm talking about than if we just sort, you sort of sit and think about it in your head because this is physical understanding stuff. It's one of those things, Numlock's probably one of those things where you think, oh, that sounds like it's going to be difficult. And actually, when you start practicing, you're going to find it's not quite as hard as you thought it was going to be. Um, but we can definitely give some, uh, you know, in the Grove and stuff, and obviously in the seminars, we can give some demonstrations of these different principles like Numlock. Yeah. Um, uh, but generally, what you want to be is exactly like a bow, and you might be sat thinking, "How do you? How do I? Like a bow that's strung, like a bow that's under tension. Even if it was just a western bow, like a long bow or something like that, it's still under one side's under compression, the other side's under stretch. How do I? How do I? I'm not using it as an analogy. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. I'm not saying pretend to be like a bow or appear to be like a bow or really be like a bow mm -hmm. and what you find is when you get deep into your spirit dance there's a lot of power in there you, I think we've mentioned this before it kind of grows or it, there's a quickening there's something that you know builds inside it mm -hmm. and the numluck is what's storing all of that power mm -hmm. That and, and it can be immense power. I mean, if, if, you know, if you imagine if someone was to get in your way while you're doing spirit dance, sometimes if you're right deep in it, uh, that that could that could lead to injury. You know, yeah. Um, it's you know, there's a huge amount of power in it, um, and um, and so you know, this is why you need a growth with nobody in it but you and you know, you take anybody out. But of course, you know, if you got your trusty on properly, you're not going to run into anybody because on a certain level, you know, they're there. You know. Mm. Um, but um, but it's it's that kind of thing, you know, to the point where you, you know, you could knock something, you know, just and it's it's not that you would set out to do that, but just with the momentum of your spirit dance, you could knock over something fairly heavy. Uh, not setting out to do that. Just I mean, if somebody suddenly something suddenly appeared that was fairly heavy. Well, not not that it they, is not that know. it is this, but to draw some sort of a comparison, yeah. if you if you throw a punch without any experience. You are you're just not going to hurt anything, but if you throw a punch with some experience, like full body weight, everything moves together as one, and it ends so, up. So, so I'm not sure that that's a good example because yeah. nothing to do with pulling punches. But, but, no, but what another way to put it? Yeah. Another way to put it is, if you got in the way of a shaman who was deep in their spirit dance, and they weren't throwing a punch, you would probably feel like you had been punched. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a better way to put it. Yeah, or that you'd you'd been hit by something heavy like a truck. Um, 
it's uh, because the asqui as well is, is this kind of thing. But you've got to remember, this is not the purpose of it, right? This is just to, trying to describe what the what the experience of it is like. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's very, very. Uh, it's a very, very powerful thing, but the movements are not in any way to do a fighting or aggressive or anything like that. There's nothing to do with that. It's just dance. It's 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 spirit dance movement. It's not any kind of fighting movement or attacking movement or anything like that. It just means that as you're moving around in this, you know, with Ashkui on this heaviness on, and the, uh, the the body storing energy like that, there's just a huge amount of energy in there. Uh, and any time you get a huge amount of energy, if something gets in the way of that, it's it's usually not that good for the something. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, so we're definitely not talking about throwing punches or anything here. Yeah, that's for the other podcast, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my point was yeah, about the experience, yeah. though, not not the throwing the punch. It was about you. Yeah, yeah. You don't know what you're doing, but then when you when you're completely locked to wait, not even locked you see you wrap yourself up with language don't you with this stuff uh, but, tell me about it this is why trying to do it in english is a nightmare mate when, this is why when like your stick, entire like body with flows and moves together <laughs> as one you yeah. move in a certain way was what my point was so the, yeah, yeah, the punch right, is irrelevant right. but the experience of of not moving together versus moving yeah. together as one yeah exactly exactly um, but that you know, it, it, there's no no punching in spirit dance. There's usually nothing like that in spirit dance for a very good reason. That would be an example of Tyrak, yeah. Yeah. And we try not to. We try our best not to overuse Tyrak because of the propensity to overuse Tyrak in spirit dance. Um, and the, the so, cutting, the Tyrak being cutting. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's not that you can't use Tyrak in in spirit dance, but it's just like that people have a natural tendency, especially settled, civilized people like us. We have a natural tendency to go mad on Tyrak when we start doing our spirit dance. So I think that's because it's, it's, it's like, just yeah. what happens naturally. If you, uh, mm. if you get, I, I'm not sure about that. I'm it not did sure for, about well. That. It did for me. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't I know, know why, know. But, but maybe that was well, maybe that's just. I, me. I, I strongly suspect that the. The miasma may have something to do with that, you know. Not, I'm not just saying you. I mean, all of us, myself included. Mm. Uh, the miasma may have something to do with that, and and you know, cu- cultures that have no miasma, i.e., pure hunter gatherer cultures. There's so few of them left in the world that it's hard to say anything statistical about them, isn't it? You know, because yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, how what would we be like if we were brought up in a pure hunter gatherer culture that had no contact with civilization or exotericism at all? Uh, would we then be obsessing over Tyrak and our spirit dance bike? I don't know. I don't know one way or the other, but my suspect, I suspect not. That's probably the, the best way to put it. Mm. Um, so, so those are two techniques. Uh, yeah, so I'm not finished though, mate. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next one, uh, Bochi, um, which is another hard to pronounce one. I'm not sure it's as hard as some of the other, the other things we've done, but it, it's not the great, is it? Bochi. Um, this is. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to um, pronounce it, uh, uh, translate it into English. I'd rather just describe the effect. Uh, do you know if you put uh, bangles on your arms or even on your legs? Uh, some uh, some dancers do. They, they sort of fly around and they make it quite a nice. You know what I mean by bangles? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. lightweight lightweight hoops of metal. And you might actually find shamans doing this kind of thing. You get another. As you, as you get experience with spirit dance, you start to understand why shamans hang uh, all that stuff off themselves, and yeah. possibly why it lingers in some cultures. I know, I know, in India they do that quite a lot. So in yeah, classical yeah. Indian it, uh, The bangles should be loose. I mean, yeah. you don't actually. I don't actually do it with bangles. I mean, I guess I could. I mean, that might be worth getting some bangles and having a go at that sometime. Um, but it's just like the feeling that you have bangles. When you're moving, you have bangles, a bunch of them hanging on your arms and, and possibly on your legs. Uh, and it's just like the bangles are very loose. And as you move around with your arms and legs, those bangles are, are moving about um, in a way that's... Even though they're loose, they, they're moving around in a way that's conducive to what you're doing. The loose of them doesn't prevent them becoming part of that energy weave it doesn't prevent them becoming part of the dance and being integrated with you mm. and so Bucky's basically um, moving like 
you've got bangles on your limbs. Um, mm. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, and, and very often when you have bangles, or pe- when you put bangles on your arms or some, anything over your arm, really, you know, shamans hang all kinds of stuff off themselves, but imagine just, say, putting a towel over your arm or something like that. When you're moving around with these things, it, it reduces the tendency, or even another way to put it is a watch, yeah? If you put a watch on and you really loosen up the band, it, it makes you, tends to stop you wanting to fling your arms out flat yeah, uh, in the, straight lines. It'll fly off, won't it? It'll fly off, exactly. So, so you ne- And that's something you never really want to do in, in spirit dances, is like go flat. So you because, move as if the bangles are part of you, part of your arm. Exactly, that's what Bucky's about. You, you right. move as if the, the bangles are loose and your, your arms and legs are containing the bangles in a way that they wouldn't go flying off if you really were wearing bangles. And now that I've thought about it, I'm going to go get me some bangles. <laughs> just like Because I've always done this without, really, you know, or when I've done it with some sort of shamanic clothing, I use the, the sleeves or whatever of the clothing is in the same sort of way. Yeah. I've definitely done it with a loose watch. Um, but do you know what I mean? But it's, it's a general feeling I know exactly of what you mean. I, I remember doing this bangles, as a kid. Yeah. I was. I, I remember just yeah. just purely playing around with this as a kid. You, you wrap a towel, and it, it just brought it back when you mentioned the towel. You put a towel around your arm, and you move the your arm around, trying to keep the towel on on your arm. And it's that's it's it. more and difficult than you think, but it's 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 quite a good feeling yeah. when it stays on, and so you that's can move bulky. it around and do whatever you want with it. Exactly, that's bulky, yeah. and and that. T- that tends to make your body form circularly. Because if your body forms circularly, that means there's nowhere for them to fly off to. Mm. Yeah? Because the movement and energy that's been transmitted through the weave, through the guruk, is always contained. It's always circular. Yeah? And so that means there is nowhere for them to, to ping off to. This is, so this is bulky. It's like having bangles on your arms. The best way I can describe it. Um, and again, just to reiterate, so that's Ashqui, Numlach, Bokki. Just to reiterate, you do not work on all three at the same time. You pick one, you work on that, then stop working on that. Hopefully some of the guruk from that has come into you. You pick another one, you work on that for a while. Some of the guruk from that comes into you, you pick another one. But do not try to do these things, to work on these things simultaneously. They are there simultaneously, but you only ever work on one because... If you try to work on two or three simultaneously, you won't get the chalicity on it. It won't merge back into chalicity. So that's my recommendation when you do your spirit dance. Just it, it, one spirit dance session, just do one of them. yeah. Mm. And then on a different occasion, do a different one or the same one again. Uh, but don't mix them up in one session. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, okay, so we're cracking on now. Moruch um, is the next one. Moruch, you can see, I mean, if you do look at... Okay, so we're going to have to put some pictures on on Patreon for this this particular episode. So we've got the bowl that needs to go up. Um, I don't know that I need to put some pictures of some bangles. I don't know if anybody doesn't know what a bangle looks like. <laughs> they probably do. If you do a search on Amazon or something, you probably find a bangle. Yeah. Um, you just got to make sure it's so, loose. So, so it Moruch, does have the potential you, to fly off if you wanted to yeah, use yeah. a bangle. So Muruch, if you look at a lot of, so especially Mongolian shamans' costumes, um, you will see that there's all sorts of stuff hanging off them. Um, those things are not light. I mean, they fly around. Um, you know, when they're, they're doing the spirit dance, they fly around very circularly, as you'll see. I think on the the teaser for the grove, there's a Mongolian shaman spinning around on there and all his costumes flying out in all directions. It looks amazing. Yeah. Um, and that's very common in Mongolia, that kind of thing, and, and in other countries as well for instance the, the japanese spirit dance i was talking about you see the circular you, if you look at their stuff for sure if you look at their stuff you will even in the static photos that are on there they're all black and white but you'll see that they've got the bangly thing going on right even though there are no bangles you can see what i mean immediately about the bohki and their movement um uh moruch is the it's like being under a covering and especially it's a whole body but especially your shoulders if you imagine being like in a tent, like a teepee, which is a bit what those costumes look like, um, and you imagine all that weight hanging down across your shoulders, uh, or like on top of your shoulders, and then pressing them down in a circular way so that your shoulders are um, forever... They're, they're, not, they're free to move, but they've always got this weight of covering on them. 
Um, it's not really there, but it's just, it's, they're behaving like it is. Yeah. And again, that tends to round the shoulders. It tends to hollow the chest. It tends to bring the elbows around closer than they would normally be in any given position. And again, this all adds to the containment. And also when you start stepping across the way, it feels like you're sliding under, you know, like you're under a tent, but the tent pole's been taken down and you're underneath. And like there's this there's this big heavy canvas tent on top of you mm. um, and you're free to move around underneath it. But when you move, it sort of slides over the top of you. You, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. The, all of this kind of thing is borky. Um, and it's, again, it's all an, an aspect of developing this physical chelicity. Um the um, the aug, uh in your in your technique, and then um, the final one that I wanted to like, there's five that I wanted to pick up basically five basic ones that I wanted to pick up is Ben uh, Taglach, um, which is um, the idea that um, the um, when when you uh you know i don't know if you've seen in some religious groups they, they if they've got a holy book no matter what it is you know fudasaki or something or whatever or a bible or the quran or whatever it is mm. they sometimes they, they sort of reverently put a cloth over the top of it while it's not being used and have you seen that kind of thing yeah uh yeah yeah like a, like a, a they do it in a reverential way they're not they're not trying to hide it or anything it's like looking after it kind of thing maybe make sure it doesn't get dust on it that cloth mm. um this is um, Bern Taglach. It's your technique is reverentially hidden from the world um, by, a, by a, a layer of containment. Um, it's probably the hardest one to describe, mm. but the, 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 the effect of it or a one side aspect of it is that spirit dance is for nobody's entertainment. Mm. It's for nobody's entertainment. If you try to make your spirit dance, quote unquote, look cool, then you will not be good at spirit dance ever. Mm. Uh, you'll be turning it into ordinary dance. You need to hide your spirit dance uh, within the containment. So effectively, think of it maybe like a event horizon or a black hole. Yeah, mm. the stuff, the energy changes that are going on are almost entirely contained within the dance, within the weave. They're not being beamed out to the world. Does that make some kind of sense? It does. Because as soon as you get into higher levels of shamanism and you want the world to come into you, into the vessel you've created, if you're beaming stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> As you see in some of these sort of qigong, these fake qigong guys, where they they light candles with their powerful kongjing and stuff, you know. Yes, um, and the match they've got. That's the exact. The that's exact. <clears throat> bleeding opposite. That's the exact opposite of what you want to be doing. Yeah. Absolutely the opposite. Nothing's going out. It's all contained, but it's not sort of a sucked in or held in physically. It's just like you're laying a cloth over the weave. That we're laying a cloth over the guluk, um, and it. It, it it's a reverential cloth. It's not trying to prevent, stop you from going out to the world. It's not that kind of cloth. Think of a permeable cloth. The world is going to come in there. That's This is the later levels as we move towards the, the journey. The world is going to come in there. Uh, it ain't going to prevent that. Um, but what it is, is your weave, your internal guruk, your internal chalisti, your ayug, is, is not e extending outwards. Yeah, mm. uh, and you see this on fake shamanism the world over this uh, oh reach up to the sky and extend your spirit up into the clouds and stuff like this and your stuff like that yeah that's the exact opposite of what a shaman does <laughs> exact mm. opposite mm. yeah the clouds come to you not the other way around yeah and so um, and so they were the five that I wanted to pick out so just to review so think of them as if if you've got hook aruk you, you're bag of shamanic techniques which we've talked about a bunch of them um then once you you start to get the hang of some of those techniques even just moving around the grove with your hands in the tarot position you can start it just from doing that if you get into a good state of chelicity with that if you've got your arm score going if you've got your like observation of self going then you can definitely that's the point where you can definitely start 
even with that simple thing, just moving around your grove in the tirok position. Mm. Uh, but do do make sure that you are moving though. You don't want to practice any of this stuff static. Um, then you can start working on these five, which are to re- to to review ashqui, that heaviness, the flesh hanging on the bones, numbluk, the energy is contained in your skeletal structure, your your ligaments, your tendons, your bones, your body, You're building up the energy potential is contained. Is is exactly is contained in exactly the same way the energy is contained in a strong bow. Not in a different way. It's the same way. Is it is it um, correct to think in terms of you building up a potential with this? As it no, in. that happens. You don't do it. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. So all all we're doing here is making sure that the the storage mechanism, if you like, is in place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where that that building of extra energy that comes out of the weave. Yeah. Uh, that comes out of the guru, mm. yeah. Um, and incidentally, on this podcast, I've been using the words guru and guru. Uh, I've only just sort of woken up after capturing 30 minutes sleep before doing this. I, I don't know if I have used them the wrong way around. Just watch out for that. Make sure I've said guru and guru the right way around in this podcast at various points. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, guru being the weave, yeah? yeah, that's the thing that builds... Guchuch being that, uh, Guchuch being the, the 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 part of shamanism that you gradually take into you and becomes part of you. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything about it. It's just there all the time. And these things are mostly about building Guchuch, yeah? yeah? But they do have implications for Guruch as well, yeah? Good. And so we've got Ashgui, which is the heaviness. You've got Numlach, which is storing energy like a bow. Um, you've got Borki, uh, which is this this thing about um, the bangles, about containing the movement of bangles, containing the, the, the weave, if you like. Um, and Muruch, um, you know, that it's not the skill of containing bangles, it's if you've got that skill, then your your chalist, your physical chalisti is on. It's rather the other way around. It's like a test of your physical chalisti. Yeah. Um, and then got Muruch, which is this idea of being covered by a heavy covering, you know, like just... Have a look at some Mongol shamans' garments as they're dancing around. You'll see what I'm talking about. That stuff's not light, right? Mm. Um, and um, bentaglach, which is this idea of containing the weave, containing your own uh, physical chalisti, containing your own energy um, within your ayug, um, such that you remain vessel-like. That you remain cup like you remain, you know. We said one time, I think we said, you know, Galahad achieved the Grail by becoming the Grail. You're becoming a Grail. Grail being a cup, right? Yeah. Uh, you're becoming a cup, and there's a tendency with spirit dances that you don't become a cup. You start beaming stuff or thinking you are beaming stuff all over the place. Actually, you're not. You just think you are. Um, but that's bad for your your physical chalisti for your ayug. Um, and basically, don't have a shred of of, of trying to look cool. Just do. Uh, yes, we've said this before. If you're a shaman, you you definitely don't have to worry about what other people think of you. They see you doing their spirit dance. They think there's a weird guy in the park. Right? That's, <laughs> that's, 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 oh no, let's keep away from him. Yeah, that's a, or her. Um, yeah, you have to you have to get yourself to a place where you don't care about stuff like that. Um, but of course, if you're doing this stuff properly, if you know, we, we said the best place to practice this is by yourself in your own grove, somewhere off in nature. Then nobody watching you. There's nobody there, um, so it, it hardly matters anyway, does it? You know. Um, but my point is really, if you ever feel that you're trying to modify your spirit dance to in at any level to make it look aesthetically pleasing um stop then stop yourself stop yourself absolutely yeah absolutely that's not what it's about yeah yeah and so um so they were basically the five um techniques the five five flip one way of course them they're all these all come out of bat they're all uh, five flavors of Burgshik Harate, which we've talked about on those podcasts that Joe referred to earlier. Mm. Um, and apply them to your spirit dance. Seven, we'll eight, go nine. through all of this stuff. Yeah, uh, we'll go through all this stuff again. And just to recap what we said earlier on is that this, that I, I don't want to conflate the idea of the threefold nature of Chalisti, which is Bat, Toshaltin, and Gokuk. That is really important in terms of the threefold nature of Chalisti. These Tonglug, Ayug, and Yathlachwi, this way of looking at splitting Chalisti up is not like that. This is levels of 
uh, a deeper understanding in terms of your mind, your body, and your spirit. Mm. Um, these these are things that, that don't, you know, Bat Toshel Teen and Guk are super real things, right? They, if you've got your list, you're on, they're there. They're, they're, they're real things that are there. Tungluk, Ayug, and Yathlachwi, they're more like places where you take your attention while you're learning. Um, they're not actually real. The whole thing's one thing, it's not three things in that respect. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you want to memorize three words that are Mongol, go Bat Toshel Teen and Guk, don't go Tungluk, Ayug, and Yathlachwi. <laughs> That's probably that. Uh, if you want to learn, if you want to learn all six, then great, well done. <laughs> say, say those again. Say the last three again. The, 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 these are the levels of uh, where shamans, Bodhisattva Harate goes at different times during their training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are Tonglug, which is kind of the mind level. When we talk about jealousy to date on the podcast, that's pretty much what we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Tonglug all the time. Yeah, yeah. that that's you not thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ayug, which is what we've talked about on this podcast. Which are the which five this, techniques of Ayug. Got you. Well, the, not the five, there are more, yeah. but the five examples of techniques of Ayug. That's that's your physical chelicity. And then Yathlachwi is, we'll get on to later, much later. Uh, that's uh, the uh, spirit level of chelicity, um, which has to do with this thing we have talked about before, this undifferentiatedness, uh, that the shaman wants to become a tea bag in the ocean. I think we talked about that one time, rather than yeah. a message in a bottle kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we'll get on to that in later podcasts. Yeah, But right at the moment, uh, it's really the idea of Ayog that, that I wanted to, to get across, which is quite important in spirit dance. You can't start working on Ayog until you can actually do a bit of spirit dance. But we have done a fair few episodes now on spirit dance. Yeah. Um, so, um, which again, to reiterate, it does go. It, this this podcast is definitely a a course kind of theme rather than just listen to any episode yeah. you want. I mean, we do have, we do have random episodes, but but really for this this podcast, we we want to be going right from the beginning because otherwise we end up spending half the episode talking about things we've already talked about just to sort of put them in the context of what we're talking about, and we end up. Um, wasting half the episode so yeah, yeah exactly exactly so so i think given given the fact that i'm on my last legs i think that's enough yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for for this one um and hopefully it's got the idea over and it, it is something important it's something you need to work on when you get into the sort of third level uh, yeah i mean you, i don't i don't know about others who have listened to the episode but the one that poked out to me was the bangles the bangle yeah, one. I just, yeah. I just instantly clicked. I went, oh, I know exactly what you mean there. So yeah, yeah. That. Well, it, what you'll Other probably find is some of these things. Thing. Some of these things um, are not as difficult as you think. It's going to be Asquid doesn't take that long to start to get right, especially if you've got somebody to copy. Mm. Um, or you know, there is, like I say on Patreon, there is a video of me doing a bit of that. Uh, Numluck is is does take quite a while. Um, Borky, but these are the things you can work on forever. You can never stop working on them, really. Uh, Borkwi uh, is the is the whole bangle thing. Borki, um, yeah, you get that. I, I imagine actually, you know, I'm just thinking back me practicing that without bangles. I'd probably been better doing it with bangles. <laughs> you know? um, and then uh, Moruch, uh, it's it's once you get it, you get it. I mean, one of the ways you can get Moruch really quickly is to get yourself one of those big sort of I don't know what you call it. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? marquee tent? Yeah, big yeah. heavy canvas marquee tent. Get the poles all out of it. Get inside and start doing your spirit dance underneath it, with it sort of over your head and shoulders, and you'll you'll get the idea of Morak pretty quick. Um, and um, and then that burn taglach. That's that's a few things in that. One is don't feel like you're reaching out or extending out to the world. Um, and also, you know, don't worry about the you know how aesthetic your your dance is. Uh, spirit dance is not aesthetic, really. I mean, it can, it can look nice, um, but it doesn't have to, and that's sort of a, a side issue, really, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and you definitely don't... The one thing you definitely don't want to be practising for your Ayug is isolating particular parts of your body and doing cool movements with them. Uh, it is amazing, that stuff. I have done some ordinary dance. Uh, I have a good friend who's uh, amazing at, at dances like reggaeton and stuff like that. Ah, oh, it looks phenomenal, man, but it ain't spirit dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, all yeah. right. Well, on that cool. note, thank you ever so much for listening, guys. Um, you can head to the website wovenenergy.com slash start dash here um, for your introductory lesson. Sign up to our email list as well. I mean, I haven't sent an email out for a long time, but uh, I, I will get back on that, especially if you start doing seminars, Damon. That'll be a good um, good way to keep in touch. Yeah. You can go to patreon.com slash wovenenergy if you would like to support us over there and get some extra cool stuff. And uh, we will see you in the next episode. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.